All of these dogs sound the same. Perhaps it's only one dog. A dog that goes everywhere you go. With the growing distance between you and the animal, you must remind yourself the sounds you are hearing coming through the trees, not the voices of loved ones, not the voices in your head, only the dog barking in the night. I think just about two or three more. These are out of order, so I'm kind of doing them in. Ill-tempered man lives here. These are the eyes of the ill-tempered man, who is of two minds. They know each other's ways. They've battled over his soul. One mind is the mind of tenderness. The other, cruelty. One mind is the mind of action. The other, stillness. Between two worlds, between two loves, the ill-tempered man moves a pilgrim of sorrows. These are the eyes of the ill-tempered man. May you never come to know his fury. Keep quiet. Be like the dead. Be one of them. Walking, crossing the ochre fields. Let the reasons to speak be the reasons not to speak. Let the mouth attend to the business of being closed, of being broken. Keep everything inside. Let it gather like ice, like crows. That's it. Thank you very much. got about a little bit of time for questions, so I'd be more than happy to try to uh, maybe explain one or two things, um, give you an idea of, you know, other than uh, what I, I talk, tried to talk a little bit about in between each of the readings. Take your time. Yeah. I have a bunch. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a gentleman who was interested in design. Yes. Uh, who cataloged them. Uh, were there, and it's, it's escaping me, Monroe, what was the, during the New Deal? The WPA. Work, WPA. Were there uh, ethnographers who went out and studied this culture and documented it? Like Neil Lomax with all of the, um, uh, the folk music. Uh -huh. You know, um, there were very few people who were really kind of paying attention to it. Um, as I kind of continued to read about it and tried to find even, you know, what would be almost like an anthropological point of view. Um, in other words, how did they, 
who decided? How did it kind of come about? And there are just a few people kind of writing about its origins. And generally, um, people started studying it in the 40s and the 50s. I think as the railroad started to decline, I think people started asking more questions, like Dreyfus, like a few other um, uh, people researching it. And generally, one of the things that they came up with was that the hobos, particularly after the Civil War and into the Depression era, were um, using some symbols that had come uh, from different um, people who, had, who were uh, immigrants, let's say. And the two main sources, because people have been studying these two cultures uh, as much as you can, and that would be the gypsy culture, who came over from Europe. Um, and with that sort of traveling, sort of nomadic kind of group, those were very important kinds of things to kind of communicate with different sort of um, cultures. And then the tinkers, who would have been Irish gypsies, if you will, um, also started to use those images and they, again, they're working off some very loose ideas and having to hypothesize quite a bit, but they really felt like it reached its sort of core set of images in the first century, or first decade of the 20th century. And um, then it pretty much stayed, remained solid with, of course, variations on the theme. But yeah, it's, there aren't a lot of people who were um, really devoting a lot of, of time and research to it. Of course, you had the World War II, which occupied everybody's mind. Then the boom and the bloom of the 50s and the 60s. And then, of course, you know, history ran its course. But um, those little pockets of people, which aren't easy, who aren't easy to find, but it was it was really very rewarding to continue to learn things from them. Well, I, I just want to say I love the uh, I love the poems, and uh, I'm reminded of the of Simic's early object poems, where he would study an object and and let that uh, let what followed it, not be a, a, a translation, but a, a, a meditation that grows out of it. Absolutely. Like, um, what was it, Bestiary for the right, no. Yeah. Was it Bestiary for the right hand? Yeah. For the right hand. Certainly, you know, uh, he's always back there, uh, as is someone who uh, lived in my hometown, Lorene Niedecker, uh -huh. uh, a poet of intense brevity and compression and really uh, fascinating sort of uh, ideas. Again, someone living very much on the periphery uh, and writing uh, uh, for you know, another audience altogether. Other questions or comments? Yeah? Um, you may have talked about this before because I didn't get your answer, but um, you write these poems as if uh, the person encountering the sign is always solitary. To what degree did the people, you know, travel in pairs or groups, and how did they teach each other for so solitary? That's a really good question. Um, I think for the purpose of this book, I did sort of imagine it from very much a solitary point of view, although they did rely on one another, and they did have things like the hobo jungle, uh, which again was something that was sort of down and away, just slightly away from uh, switching yards in major cities. Um, so I think, let me answer one part of it, I think older hobos would, you know, instruct in one way or another uh, the greenhorns or the people who were, you know, uh, just starting out. And um, um, it's, it, you know, I think the other real big influence, and I have to admit that ever since I first read the play, and I was always frustrated and in love with it, and always going back to it saying, this time I'm going to understand the play. Uh, and that is Waiting for Godot. Uh, by Samuel Beckett, where his two main characters are two tramps, and they are constantly sort of 
having this bickering support, this really interesting kind of dynamic between the two of them. So as I developed those poems, I wanted to try to get what I admired so much about Beckett into it in little sneaky places. If you read it real closely and you read Beckett really closely, you can say, oh yeah, he took that right from this one. Which I think the writers like to do. I should say that um, I've talked to about, since this book has come out, um, I've talked to about maybe five or six people who said, oh, you know what? Um, my grandma always fed hobos at the back door. And certainly, uh, my father told me this story first, and that they lived about maybe four blocks away from the railroad tracks up in Green Bay. And uh, for some reason, um, and it was probably because we had that circle with an X in it uh, near our house, or my, my dad's house, uh, my grandmother's house, uh, they would always come to the back door, and my grandmother would recognize them, and she would very, very quickly uh, make them a fried egg sandwich. Get a piece of bread, and fry an egg up, put it on the bread, and just give it to them. They never came in the house, and my grandma and my dad uh, he would raise his eyebrows, and he said, we were never to talk to them. We never were supposed to even go out of the house when they were around. And because I have pretty much a, a real, a, a lot of Irish kind of background, I think my grandmother was sort of thinking more about the tinkers, uh, the Irish sort of gypsies, because, you know, there was always this belief that they would abduct you and kind of take you, and, you know. Again, uh, a, a Simic reference of a poem by Simic, and he's spending half the time with a silver spoon in his mouth, and another time uh, in, in the caravan. So that's, uh, so it, um, I hope I answered your question for the most part. Kind of got off the track. Other questions? Other, yeah. When you, I know that you used to, when you used to jump, we talked about when you used to jump trains. Right. Were there hobos around then? Yeah, there were just a few uh, in, in certain parts of Green Bay that, you know, again, you just, when you stumbled or wandered into those areas, you felt like, I shouldn't be here, I really shouldn't be here. Um, um, and I remember, I think I told you, um, one of the things that happened to me when I was really young, thank you for coming, I, uh, um, um, was that um, we, were, we were hopping the trains to uh, go to, to junior high, of course that was what it was called then, and um, uh, oh, uh, Bucky Fitzgerald uh, in mid-January is hopping a train and he, you know, because it's, the snow has been piled up, uh, and the, it's just like a channel between this hard-packed ice in that uh, he was killed uh, and he, you know, kind of slid under the rails. So that was something that, after that, everyone was pretty much terrified. And I think that extended to uh, when you saw someone near the train yards. Because I lived only about five houses away from the railroad tracks. Well, your brother-in-law, Michael, was a little older. He told me that he remembered we talked during the reading, that he remembered hobos. He said there was one called uh, Bad Mike, who was, uh, the, the kids would all go, uh, apparently, in that neighborhood and go and hop the trains, and they'd leave their bikes, and if Bad Mike was around, you couldn't do that, because he would take the bike, he would steal it, and then go f find a place to sell it and drink. Uh, so uh, you, you had to watch out for Bad Mike. That was done. Yeah, I think that's definitely, you know, even coming back to uh, Maurice's comment, like who kind of kept these or who studied them, I think it exists much more in, you know, the stories that we tell and the things that people begin to remember about it. Uh, I'm sure 